Welcome to today's webinar on pandemic effects and library directions. And this webinar is focused primarily on the Africas, Americas and Europe region in order to suit time zones that work there. We're really happy to have some of our great friends from OCRC with us in order to talk about some key research some really useful, valuable research that they've been putting out and that we hope will really be of value for libraries of all sorts around the world, both during the pandemic in understanding its effects on libraries, but also in terms of looking to the future, drawing, from, drawing on the ideas of some great thinkers around the world. So we have two fantastic speakers with us. We have Ishel Faniel, who's a senior research scientist at OCLC, whose research interests include improving how people discover, access, and use and reuse content, and who's currently examining how academics manage, share, and reuse research data and librarians' experiences, and in particular has worked on the Pandemic Experiences Project. We also have with us, fortunately, Kendra Morgan, uh, Kendra is um, Kendra works at, uh, as a senior program manager at Web Junction, focusing a lot on core continuing education services for state and public libraries, and she's been very strongly involved in the Realm project, which we'll be hearing a lot about today. So, with that, I want to hand over directly. And we'll be starting with Michelle. Um, Please do note that you can use the Q&A function, the button at the bottom of the screen, in order to ask your questions. There's also a chat function. We'd encourage you, if possible, to use that Q&A function because it also allows colleagues to see what questions are being asked, to build on them, and hopefully have a really good discussion. So with that, I will stop and I will hand over to you, Michelle, please. Thank you, Stephen. Hopefully everyone can see my slides. I'm gonna put them in presentation mode. Just one second. There we go. So first, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to talk with everyone today. Uh, and before getting things underway, I also just want to thank my colleagues that you see here for the time and the effort that they dedicated to this project. Back in March of 2020, we began to put our heads together as we began to hear and read about what libraries were experiencing during the pandemic and how they were responding. It turned into the uh, New Model Library Project. So today I'm gonna share some findings, uh, but, um, but we also published an OCLC research briefing in the fall. So I would encourage you to read that and I can share a link um, once I'm done with the presentation. The project was really designed to identify challenges and opportunities brought about by the pandemic. We were interested in how library leaders were responding to the pandemic, but also what new library models might emerge as a result of the changes brought about by the pandemic. So in terms of library models, what we were really interested in um, was the essence of what libraries are and how they function. From April to July of 2020, we interviewed 29 library leaders from around the world, 17 in the Americas, nine in Europe and Middle East, and then three in Asia Pacific. They were also from different types of libraries in urban, suburban, and rural areas. Uh, 21 were from academic uh, libraries, 10 were at research universities, eight at four-year colleges or universities, and then three at two-year academic institutions. We also interviewed seven uh, leaders from public libraries and one from a national library. So even though the library leaders were at different stages of the pandemic uh, during our discussions and their responses were nuanced and varied given their local context, when we began to analyze the data, we did see that patterns emerged. The specifics of their experiences differed, but the direction and the intensity of their changes that they were making, they were similar. Drawing from their experiences, they provided insight into what they saw as their future in terms of their plans. And we describe their transformations as movements toward their new model library. And we found that these transformations could be described in terms of three experiences. Work experiences that address flexible and changing job environments, collections experiences that include physical, digital, and electronic resources, and engagement experiences that focus on impersonal, I'm sorry, in-person and virtual connections. So many of the changes that I'm gonna describe today, they may sound familiar uh, because they were underway prior to the pandemic. 
In some cases, the pandemic accelerated changes that were already underway. Implementations occurred more quickly. In other cases, the pandemic intensified the need for changes, which prompted action. So the strength or the importance of the change was increased or elevated. We were also able to identify four areas of impact um, that the leaders new model library visions would have on their library, their staff and their communities. So agility, and that's about taking quick innovative action in response to changing circumstances and expectations. Collaboration involves working with stakeholders to lead change within libraries, institutions, and communities. And then virtualization, which was about expanding online library experiences for staff and the community. And lastly, space, which involved finding new ways to engage with the physical library. So I'm gonna start with, uh, in terms of the experiences, I'm gonna start with work experiences. And this is where library leaders really envisioned making changes that would impact agility and collaboration by focusing on embracing flexible work, fostering well-being in the work environment, training for the future, and challenging traditional divisions of labor. So everyone didn't necessarily thrive in a remote work environment, but what they did welcome was the flexibility that came with it. Um, and that's really what leaders are looking to maintain moving forward. As this library leader from a research university in the Netherlands said, we think that working from home and working in the office, that mix will be the new normal. So we're looking at how that can work. But questions remained. For this leader, it was about well, how would that impact the people? For other leaders, it was trying to figure out how to create that mix uh, given the library's formal structure. So a key part of answering these kinds of questions is um, considering the staff's needs alongside the library mission and operations. So considering individuals, preferences and work styles and needs alongside the nature of work within a department or function, the types of activities uh, that need to be completed during working hours, the staff's connection to each other and the library and the community, ensuring that staff's needs and choices don't really impact their opportunities within that space is also critical. You, we wanna ensure that they still have equal access to the same opportunities regardless of their chosen work arrangement. The next finding really speaks to the uncertainty and change that came with everything that happened uh, since early 2020. And now we've seen well-being be put front and center. But this library leader in Australia um, hit on something in describing that the pandemic really wasn't the only factor in terms of the uncertainty and change that the world felt, right? There were things that happened before the pandemic in different parts of the world. There were things that were that are happening and are, are, um, after the pandemic. And for this library leader, the uncertainty and the change from the pandemic was actually layered on top of fires and smoke, hailstorms and rain and water damage all of these things that happened before the pandemic. And as this leader explained, change is hard. We will feel unsafe, scared, and nervous for years. At a certain point, we will have to go and have a break. You need to have a process that recognizes that. So during the pandemic, library leaders recognized and responded to staff's well-being through their words and their actions the best they could from a distance. Envisioning the future, they also wanna reevaluate what's in place to foster well-being in that work environment. And when doing so, it's important that they work together with staff to ensure that in terms of what they're doing to foster well-being is really steeped in culture and is well aligned with policies and practices. They also need to find ways to model behavior that they want staff to embrace. During the pandemic, training was also key in helping staff adapt to new work environments and service delivery models. In this quote from a library leader at a four-year college in Greece, she noted, we started learning, all of us, getting online, doing tutorials, LinkedIn, discussion forums, round tables, reading the Chronicle of Higher Education, looking at what everyone else was doing 
and trying to bring in the good things and also reassure our people. In the future, library leaders wanna to continue to prioritize this, these kinds of learning opportunities. So staff are well prepared for the future. They're looking to cross-train staff to develop more versatile skill sets so that they can move more easily between tasks and responsibility, improve communication and coordination, adapt to staffing changes. And that's whether it's sick days, extended leaves, fluctuations in service, or the development of new services. It's about planning and prioritizing training with staff year to year to, try to help communicate those expectations maintain the, cur the curriculum, but also ensure the time and resources are continuously made available. In addition to agility, the leaders also see future changes impacting collaboration. So as this leader from a four-year college in the United States observed, now the lines are blurred and the walls are down. So we all kind of do the same thing. And I think that's a good thing because we can get more work done that way. So the question really becomes, now that these walls are down, how to take advantage of that to reach or increase organizational capacity? Looking at future structural changes, leaders are thinking about what staff expertise they have and can develop. And they're also thinking about the library's mission and the needs of the community. And given all of that, they're asking, can departments be created or combined to better align activities? and respond to planned and unplanned changes. For instance, integrated, integrating reference and instruction functions to support consistent messaging and services. For some smaller libraries, the question may be, is the department-based structure necessary or can they rely on cross-training and empower their staff with broad knowledge and skills to work where needed? Others wanna figure out how to align their structure more closely to the institution's mission. I want to turn to the collections experience. And this is where leaders are in, in terms of their visions for their new model libraries. These, these visions are impacting virtualization in space by acquiring digital and open content strategically, creating new connections to physical collections, and prioritizing resources that close the digital divide. The surge in digital resources, although not new, highlighted short and long-term challenges that the leaders still need to tackle, such as continuing to negotiate license, licensing terms with publishers or figuring out new ways to exert their influence through their consortia. But the future is also about improving discoverability and accessibility for the community, as this library leader from an urban public library in Canada discussed. I would love to see the platforms use the library as the gateway to their services. That would be a wonderful thing. You go to a library website, you can use your library password, and that process is seamless. That would be a wonderful, magical event. And the same can be said with academic libraries. Students and faculties would, faculty would love to have things seamlessly available to them through their learning management systems. It's about ease of use, um, but it's also about not being blocked from access because there aren't enough user licenses. So another thing librarians are doing in academic libraries are working with faculty to identify high quality open educational resources suitable for students and their learning goals. Leaders are looking to create new connections to physical collections as well. So contactless discovery and delivery took off during the pandemic. We, there was a lot of talk about curbside pickup, for instance. And these services that were created out of a necessity during the pandemic are now being converted to a convenience offering. But it's not an either or choice between digital and physical collections as this library leader from Spain said, I think we should have to rethink what we are doing, the budget we invest on printed collections and also things like withdrawals and to create a policy for, the collection, for collection management that is more precise, more accurate to the needs of our users. In other words, it's really about a balance, right? And being able to strike that balance between meeting community needs and making the internal and operational changes that need to happen within the library. Leaders are also thinking about designing new policies and workflows for technology-mediated discovery and access of physical materials, such as virtual access to special collections and archives, 
or allowing people to order items through an online seller for delivery to their home or their office. Leaders in academic and public libraries also see prioritizing resources to close the digital divide as a big part of their future, even after their reopening. As this library leader from a research university in Hong Kong said, we need to have free access to information because of the digital divide. I want to address this issue with the library. This is my mission, mission in the coming five years. And this is also the biggest challenge. But it's not just about getting access to information via Wi-Fi and computers, right? It's also about teaching people digital liter literacy skills, how to navigate the information that's available online, how to evaluate it, how to separate fact from fiction, right? Call out misinformation and disinformation. It's about bringing all of those things together into a larger agenda. In terms of engagement experiences, we're really talking about experiences that may happen in the library building, online, or out in the community. And library leaders' visions of their new model libraries when it comes to engagement experiences are impacting from our findings space, virtualization, and collaboration. As they look to lead with a hybrid approach, uh, invite engagement in physical spaces, as well as partner with a purpose. So in terms of the virtual offerings during the pandemic, we definitely saw an uptick, right? Libraries saw an uptick in attendance and reach, but virtual programming as a standalone or just running in parallel to person to in-person events or programming is not necessarily a, a future plan for library leaders. They see the benefit of engaging with their communities virtually, but they really wanna be strategic about it when it comes to the delivery mode, the content and the timing, especially as they seek to reach out to those that are left out of in-person offerings, as well as they also seek to maximize staff time and staff expertise. A library leader here um, that's quoted here from a four-year college in Canada expressed a similar sentiment when it came to staffing. But in five years, I think we'll be delivering digitally much more so that my librarian could be anywhere, so that we can reach a larger audience or more of our audience I have one librarian. She can't teach every class that comes past. Rather than create virtual experiences, experiences in isolation, it's about thinking about designing them in the context of a set of experiences that draw on and complement one another. It's also about considering whether or not resources could be pooled across libraries to create virtual content that's foundational and common, but then look to um, on your own campus, personalizing in-person content to the needs of your particular campus or community. Library leaders are also planning a future for the physical space of their libraries. This library leader from a two-year college in the United States said, if anything, we're gonna build a new library. The physical presence isn't shifting away, yes, have online services, but we want the physical. Leaders wanna treat space as a service where the community can gather in different ways and for different purposes. They wanna have space with no preconceived notions about how it should be used. Working with the community to develop a deep understanding of current as well as potential users will be important um, in thinking about what it means to create inclusive and equitable spaces in terms of design and use policies and staff. When it comes to partnering, it's not new for, this is not new for the library community or the library leaders we spoke to. They relied on it heavily during the pandemic. They relied on it heavily prior to the pandemic. It's gonna continue. What they're looking to do really though is to boost the value of the engagement experiences they create in ways that are beneficial for them their partners and the community they support. So this leader from an urban public library in Canada discussed one of their partnerships. We established these really great partnerships with these food banks and they understood the library and we understood food banks way more. Now we have two food banks that continue to be distributed to two of our branches. The other thing we did 
with our food banks is that we started putting children's books in the food bank hampers. So like this leader here, others wanna do more to coordinate complementary expertise and resources to create a more integrated full service solution to community needs. For academic library staff with expertise in instructional technology that might be seeking partnerships with student services, with their IT departments, as well as with faculty to support student success. Leaders also wanna work more closely alongside their partners at their partners locations to listen, observe and learn how the community can contribute or how they can contribute to the community, excuse me. They wanna extend the library's reach beyond the current locations and communication channels that they're currently using. So the partners in the community can see what the library can offer in a new light and that those, those partners and those, that community can provide immediate firsthand insight into their specific challenges. The leaders wanna create a more engaged network of partners that support common goals and cross communication efforts that highlight the value of the, and the impact that each partner brings to the relationship. So today I've shared just some of the changes that libraries are, or library leaders are taking into the future, but they shouldn't be taken as absolutes. These are not the only ways in which um, the future um, can roll out or um, could roll out. There are no universal right answers to the question uh, really of what a new model library will look like. What my colleagues and I expect um, is that each library will choose what they wanna pursue based on their local context. There's the uncertainty of budget staffing, there's social and economic changes. There are evolving community and stakeholder needs and expectations. And we all expect those changes will continue to evolve. And as the work collections and engagements continue, uh, engagement experiences continue to change, so too will agility, collaboration, virtualization, and space, the four areas impacting new model, new model library visions. That is why we plan to continue convening library leaders and staff around these topics to share what, we've, what we know and also use that to contextualize discussions, but also hear what they're doing and what's changing. So what I'm gonna do as I close or get to the end of this presentation is really encourage you to think about what you heard today, take a look at the briefing and reflect on your own experiences over the last two years. Get together for a conversation with colleagues to talk about what your new model library will look like. Will it be about any of these things on the list here or something else? We've recently published a learner guide um, as a companion to our briefing. And that's really designed to facilitate this reflection and conversation that I'm talking about. And I'll share that link as well. So what's next for us is, first, I just wanna thank the library leaders for talking to us at the height of the pandemic and in, in many cases, not only about what they were doing and how they were responding in the moment, but also what they saw in terms of their vision for their new model library. I'd also like to thank our colleagues at OCLC who supported and provided feedback over the course of this project. In terms of our next steps, it's really about convening discussion groups with library leaders and staff. We wanna to continue to participate in webinars such as this. So again, thank you for allowing me to participate today. And then we're also going to be collecting additional data through focus groups with library leaders. We wanna see what's changed since these last interviews. So with that, I'll thank you uh, for your time and attention. And I'm going to pass it over to Kendra so she can start her uh, presentation. Thanks so much, Ashal. Um, I'm going to switch over to sharing my screen for all of you. And here we go. All right. It's always great even to hear from my own colleagues here at OCLC about the work that they're doing. Um, I 
have been so interested in the new model library work because it really reflects a lot of what has been happening with the Realm project uh, since we started in April of 2020 and what we've been hearing from the archives, libraries, and museums community. So you'll definitely see that connection as I move through the information about the Realm project and how it really feeds into the experience that we have all been having during the pandemic. So, I'm going to start off and say that um, the Realm Project is really a uh, partnership between several organizations. So we have OCLC, of course, um, as one of the uh, leads on the project, helping to gather and synthesize input from stakeholders in the field, um, publishing the research findings that are part of our efforts, uh, and then collecting, creating, and sharing examples uh, through our Realm Toolkit. The project itself is funded here in the United States by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which is the largest funder of libraries here uh, as, and also supports the museums and archives community. They have been funding the project and took a very strong leadership role right from the beginning. Uh, and they are continuing to be engaged in the work and supporting the project goals and activities. Uh, they have also convened some of the key stakeholders on the project, so a steering committee and several working groups. We've also worked throughout with colleagues at an organization called Battelle. Uh, and Battelle has been doing all of the scientific research that was conducted particularly in the first year of the project uh, on materials that were found in archives, libraries, and museums, as well as ongoing research briefings and literature reviews. And then finally, one of our key partners are representatives from the libraries, archives, and museums community. Uh, they have been directly engaged with um, the project steering committee, as well as both an operations and a scientific working group, lending their expertise, uh, their experiences, talking to us and vetting the research that we have produced and helping us to uh, steer the direction of the project. Uh, the core project activities have been, and again, we started this really back in April of 2020 at uh, the behest of the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And it's to look at the research that's being published and how it relates to archives, libraries, and museums, engaging with subject matter experts to find out how we could elevate some of their concerns uh, or what they saw as being key issues to the LAM community. And then we've been publishing tests that really, uh, we published tests of materials, uh, and this was to see how long the coronavirus lasted on materials that are commonly found in like libraries, archives, and museums. We published the last findings in April or January of 2021. So it's been about a year since we've had any of those uh, tests, but we're continuing to publish research briefings and literature reviews. Uh, and we're turning these into toolkit resources that can be repurposed by the library archives and museums community. Uh, and we're continuing to gather, synthesize and share the learning uh, through presentations such as this uh, and the opportunity to hear from the field and what they're finding to be most relevant at this time. Some of the core things that we want people to be able to do with this research is to take the findings uh, that have come out of the work that Battelle has done and that we have surfaced with our project steering committees and really apply that to their local situation. Um, there are no one size fits all recommendations or guidelines. We really want people to look at the information and then consider how it might impact their local decisions and policies. And it really is that you know every library and every museum and archive is different and they need to make those decisions based on their local facilities and services, staff, the community, and resources that they have available. Uh, one thing that I think we've all become very certain of over the last two years is that change is constant. So if you're watching this uh, recording in the future, there's a good chance that there is new information available. So check out the Realm website, and I'll be able to share some links um, when we wrap up uh, and look for the latest news under the Happening Now section to find out what we've released most recently. 
So some of the things that Michelle alluded to in her presentation were these changes to services and policies that libraries had seen evolve. And these were libraries around the world um, that were and of different types, right? So we've got academics and publics that were all looking at how their services had had to change and how they think that might impact their work going forward. Um, from how to manage staff to visitors to cleaning and usage policies, the range of new and novel issues uh, confronting our cultural institutions has really been persistent. And part of the Realm Project has been capturing these changes uh, and challenges and sharing them, right? There's something, there's something a little comforting about knowing that you're not in these things alone. We've certainly held many meetings and sessions where people just want to talk about how they're getting past the next hurdle in their work. Uh, and hearing from people who may have had something similar or can at least sympathize with the challenges. Um, we're also seeing that some of these challenges are common in other institutions and businesses entirely and how can we learn from the ways that they are adapting? One of the, uh, I would say in, in the past two years, um, one of the cornerstones um, for me in terms of things that I have read uh, has been a, an article that was published back in September of 2020 by researchers in the UK. In, uh, it was published in BMJ. And it all touched on the anxiety and uncertainty people felt around making decisions during the pandemic. And it just really captured truly what some of what I was feeling as, you know, as a professional, as a family member, um, as a citizen of the world, trying to navigate the decisions that I was making. And it put some context into what it feels like, why we're feeling challenged, and they laid out these five points. They, they called them rules to help with decision making. Uh, and the first is that understanding that most data that we have is flawed or incomplete. And we can be honest and transparent about this. So if we don't know, we can say we still don't have that answer. The second is that we may never have a final answer for many questions. And do you wait for certainty or act on the evidence that you have? And this is certainly holding true throughout this pandemic. There are things that started off as uh, what we captured as known unknowns, and I'll touch on them in a bit, but those are still unknown points. So we may never know. We're two years into a tremendous amount of research on a global scale, and we still can't answer some of these questions, and we've still had to move forward. The third is acknowledging the complexity, admitting ignorance, and being open to exploring paradoxes. So might you have to have different rules for different sets of people at different times, and acknowledging that it may not always make sense, it may not be perfect, but this is the plan that we have now, and it's how we're moving ahead. The fourth is understanding that different people interpret data differently. So seeking out perspectives from um, outside of your organization or from different departments within your organization, how do they see uh, a certain decision or data impacting them and what might that mean? And it might change the direction of your decisions. And then finally, observing real world in interventions can complement the findings of controlled trials and other forms of evidence. So what can we learn about you know, human behavior in our personal spaces at work um, that may impact our decisions? And one of the things that I really want to acknowledge is the tremendous amount of decision fatigue that we are all feeling at this point. Um, no one wants to have to keep making decisions or continue to change policies on these things that are can be very emotional and challenging. So acknowledging that, that that's what our staff is going through in their personal and professional lives is really important so that we can continue to have compassion, not only for them, but for ourselves as we navigate through some of this. Some of the changes to services and policies that we have seen um, have included, and especially from the library side, but increased digitization projects as people found themselves at home. They may have had access to equipment that made digitization, adding metadata even easier from, a, from their home than it was 
um, of, of all the things that they could do, it may be a little bit more accessible. Here in the United States, we've also heard of libraries and museums serving as vaccination sites and uh, COVID test distribution kits, um, working on curbside pickup. Um, so the evolution of some of these things aligned with work that they did before that was connecting to creating healthy communities. Some of it was brand new. Um, many libraries had never considered doing curbside pickup, but this was a, an evolution that allowed them to continue to serve the community in a safe way for both their patrons and the staff. And as it gives us the opportunity, as, as Shell was sharing, to really rethink what it is we're doing and how we deliver our services into the future. Beyond our daily policies and services, strategic planning is really another area where we can start rethinking how we move and change with the community and the staff. One of the members of our scientific working group is Dr. Frederick Bertley, who is the director of the Center of Science and Industry located in Columbus, Ohio. And in January of 2020, they did a strategic planning event and they asked, what would a science museum be if it didn't have bricks and mortar? And they acknowledged that an increasing online presence was certainly part of that vision, but that came with a huge challenge because the online space can be very competitive. So they noted that this would also be about community, those partnerships that Ishel touched on with the new model library thinking, relationships, impact and the staff started to outline what these would look like what the activities and services would look like if they were able to um, to change and that early thinking was able to help seed some of the immediate changes that they made heading into the uh, the pandemic Dr. Bertley shares his experience at his organization in a video that we have captured, uh, and it's a series of videos and written interviews called Perspectives from the Field, which are all part of uh, the Realm resources. And I'd like to ask all of you in chat is what changes, and you can go to the chat section in Zoom, and what changes to your services and policies would you like to see retained beyond the lifespan of the pandemic? What do you want to keep? Um, what has given you energy or that you have seen really resonate with your users, your patrons, your customers? What do you want to see retained as we move through the pandemic? What's part of your new model? Try and pull up the chat and see if we have any hybrid programming, right? Being able to offer things to people um, that they can be in person or virtual. Um, recognition by the institution that the library is a core part of their activities, really seeing that that is uh, essential to the success of their organization asynchronous instruction materials, right? Making sure that people can get to things offline or online. Expanded bilingual services, that's fantastic. Having more staff to be able to engage with patrons um, at different levels. Fine free, going fine free. That has been a huge conversation here in the United States for sure, um, where late fees are often um, connected to returning materials late, um, which creates inequity often in the community and reduces usage um, and even the return because people are, are concerned. So that's a great evolution. Um, Zoom meetings uh, has made it like we've had, we've been able to cut down on the amount of travel that we've had to do, especially for shorter meetings, right? You can just jump on a quick Zoom call. Thank you for sharing some of these. It's just great to hear um, what you all have in common and what you are all thinking as you, um, as we move through this time. So I wanna talk briefly about the status of the COVID-19 research that this project has touched on. Um, we started off in 2020 with three key research questions. And this was really put under the umbrella of how does it impact archives, libraries, and museums, right? So how might SARS-CoV-2 spread through general operations in our institutions? 
how effective are various prevention and decontamination tactics, many of which are not suitable for our cultural institutions because they may cause damage to our materials. And then very early, how long does the virus remain active on this material on materials and surfaces? So for that last question, we worked with Battelle uh, on actually taking materials that are found in archives, libraries, and museums and testing the longevity of coronavirus on these materials. And you can find all of these research findings published on the Realm website. I'll share those links when I wrap up. One of the key things that we did find uh, that is of particular interest is that when materials are stacked, so either you know in a book drop or next to each other on a, um, on a shelf where they're not exposed to air or light, the virus can survive much longer than it can if the material is, um, is open and accessible to light and air. That's a, that was a finding that was not uh, something that Battelle, our research partner, was really expecting. Uh, they had never tested something like that. Stacking and testing materials was not something that we had found replicated in other scientific research. So this was something that was unique to the Realm project. Um, I want to emphasize that what we understand now, when we started this project, we didn't know how the virus was going to be spread. We do understand now that the greatest risk of spread is person-to-person -person contact. But in the early days of the, the pandemic, understanding you know, how, much, how long it might take for the virus to dissipate from materials was a key question as in the library archives and museums community. They wanted to know how to handle their public spaces and what they should be concerned about. We know that we, we need to focus most heavily on uh, managing person-to-person -person contact. Um, this body of research, though, was submitted to the Peer Review Journal of Applied Microbiology and received confirmation, and that research is expected to be published in the journal later this year. We've also continued the research. So I mentioned that the testing of materials wrapped up in January of 2021. And we transitioned to continuing to look at the research around how variants might impact public health interventions, um, how vaccinations might uh, implement po affect policies related to indoor environments, and the effect on ventilation on spread, especially when you think about some of our older buildings or places that don't have manual uh, or automated uh, circulation and ventilation. So we've continued to look into these three aspects of our research. Um, and there are still three things that are unknown at this point. I mentioned this early when I was talking about the, uh, the BMJ man article on managing uncertainty. We still don't know exactly how much virus takes um, or an infected person will leave on an object. If I sneeze, I don't know what's going to be left behind because there are too many variables um, in terms of you know, the, the strength of the sneeze, how sick I was at the time. We don't know how much a virus a person can pick up from an object. It depends greatly on how long ago material uh, the virus was deposited on that object. So if I sneezed on it, um, am I, is someone else touching it an hour later, 15 minutes later, three days later? So we don't know what that transfer might look like. And we still don't know how much virus is needed to cause infection. And when you consider all the, the, the variables with individuals, that's not entirely surprising, right? We have so many individual differences, um, compromised immune systems, that being able to nail down a number to say, this is what it takes to become infected is, is actually very difficult. So we do know, as I mentioned, most likely we've got contact between people, droplets pass between people and tiny particles floating in the air is, is how the virus is spreading. There are possibilities around contaminated objects like those that we may find in our cultural institutions and also other bodily fluids. When we think about prevention and decontamination tactics, physical distancing continues to be one of the things that um, is advocated for by public health. Um, good hand washing continues to be part of this message. 
wearing masks uh, to protect yourself and others from particles that may be in the air and getting fresh, clean air circulated throughout your buildings and being outside. Under certain conditions, we know that some surface cleaners and disinfectants may be helpful, as well as ultraviolet light treatments. The challenges that we see in our cultural institutions is that they may not be appropriate because of damage that can be caused to the materials. And that is true both of surface cleaners and UV light. They can both damage our materials. So in most cases, we recommend that people allow for natural attenuation, which is just letting the virus disappear naturally. Um, it ages, it dies off naturally. Um, but our surfaces, countertops, things like that, which aren't uh, at risk of being damaged, can work in our public spaces. So I wanted to talk about some of the resources that you'll find available in, on the Realm website as part of the body of work. Uh, the first is uh, a series of um, articles, uh, checklists. Uh, I mentioned managing uncertainty as one of the ones that has resonated most with me, but we also have reopening considerations, uh, decision-making checklists, understanding who you need to engage, what that communications chain is going to look like, um, looking at different examples of libraries and museums and their reopening plans, uh, which I think you can all sympathize have probably changed about seven or eight times since this started, um, the number of iterations that people have had to go through. Um, some tips on cleaning and disinfecting and what people need to understand um, about potential damage. Um, we have those lab test results in visual format, again, Please remember that we, we do know that it more of an airborne concern than on those materials, but it's helpful to understand um, the possibility of that as a concern and how to be mindful of that potential spread. And then we have uh, a, a series of videos around um, the perspectives from the field from various uh, directors um, at libraries and museums. We also have a series of roundups. Uh, we call these resource roundups on a variety of topics where we have found examples in the field of people addressing this in their work. So with risk assessment, trauma management, I think that's a really big one that we all need to continue to acknowledge is the ongoing challenges that people are faced. And it was one of the quotes that Ashel shared about the new model library is how people, they're eventually going to need a break um, in order to, to stay healthy um, and to address their individual personal needs and what we need to be aware of um, in ourselves, uh, in the people that we work with and the people that we manage. Um, if we don't have staff members in the right headspace to be able to show up, um, they won't be able to serve the patrons. So we really need to figure out how to support and take care of them so that they can do that effectively. We also have a few on virtual programming, uh, managing social distancing within our institutions uh, and communication and signage. The last thing that I want to touch on um, is vaccine information and confidence. Um, the dark green on this map depicts the percentage of a country's population that are fully vaccinated. So it gets as high as 80% and as low as well below 20%. Um, this there's tremendous variety throughout the world, and it's dependent on, on several very complex factors. One is just access to vaccines, right? That can include limited capacity to obtain a supply of vaccines. It's also a major concern in countries that are experiencing other humanitarian crises, such as armed conflicts and war, um, where it's simply not safe, um, or at this point, truly a priority to distribute vaccine in those locations. 
And then we have vaccine hesitancy. So some people are just hesitant about receiving the vaccines due to concerns about ingredients in the vaccines, side effects, misinformation that they have heard um, about the research uh, or the um, long-term effects of these vaccines. In the United States, we're sitting at about 64% of the population being fully vaccinated and hesitancy continues to be a concerning issue. And this is an area where we are seeing libraries and museums as trusted institutions helping to support vaccine confidence by providing access to trusted information and sources. And I wanted to highlight a few of the projects that are underway here that connect on to this. Um, the first is from the Smithsonian uh, Institution, and they are talking resources, they're providing resources on talking about vaccines to kids, to teens, and to seniors. They have Spanish language options, and they also have interviews and perspectives from the community around this. And it's the project website has a great range of free resources and information available. Uh, and it's a, it's a great resource to be able to check out to see the range of supporting information to help with the vaccine confidence. The second project is uh, led by the Association for Science and Technology Centers, along with several partners, and they are directly engaging museums and libraries as trusted community partners um, and looking at uh, providing funding. They've already done several rounds of grants to help with local community education. So they're making direct impact through our cultural institutions to try and support the distribution of accurate information around vaccination to decrease hesitancy and increase the vaccination rate. The ASTC ASTC, which is leading the project, is also a member of the Realm Steering Committee. So it's been great to have their contributions. So I just want to, and I'll put some of these links in uh, when I wrap up, but please go to the website uh, and you can get all of the resources freely available uh, from the site. And you can also sign up for email updates. Uh, we send them out usually once or twice a month with new content that has been added to the site. And there are also some frequently asked questions. All of the research uh, that we publish to date is also available. All right. Thank you so much, Kendra. I apologize, as you've seen, it's, it's got dark here in the course of this way. <laughs> so you can see that it's now considerably darker behind me. So first of all, we have five minutes left until the, the, the planned closure. So I wanted to make sure if there are any questions from our audience, please do place them in the Q&A or put them in the chat. Otherwise, I certainly have one. I would note already what we will do is we've recorded this webinar and all of the resources that are being shared, we will include with the recording that will go up on the IFLA channel. Of course, at the same time, go to the OCLC website. Everything's also available there too. So I'll just give a few seconds for Q&A. Any questions? Otherwise, I will jump on the opportunity and ask, um, hopefully not a too complicated question that can to take short answers. Um, I, I think you both, know, Kendra brought out very strongly this sense of people are sick of taking decisions and, and sick of not being able to take things for granted and, and, and plan so much for the future. And it's normal, that's, that's just part of human psychology that we tend to like certainty and like things that we know rather than things that we don't. And that's, that's the standard thing. What do you think we've learned about how we can make ourselves how we can improve our ability to deal with uncertainty, to deal with change. Uh, I particularly like the example from the Center of Science and Industry in Columbus of encouraging those sorts of exercises, incredibly timely ones in that case, in, in the case of January 2020, getting people to think about, well, not planning for the present, but planning for the future, getting people to, to work with these. I don't know, have you picked up interesting lessons, interesting guidance on how we can get better ourselves or at least find planning for uncertainty less stressful and, and go at it with a more positive frame of mind. 
I definitely think it's a muscle that we all need to work on flexing. You know, the more that we become comfortable having those conversations, that we do it with colleagues who welcome that as a discussion, that you feel supported in having those conversations, it's always helpful and encourages that willingness to share. Uh, it is it is hard. Um, I think one of the questions that we've always asked, you know, if you could have whatever you want, and sometimes that's like, take money off the table, because that's the thing that we always say, if we had more money, we could do this. But as one of our colleagues says, what would your magic wand be able to do? You know, what would you be able to change? And practicing doing that and asking people to think beyond, uh, it's that classic brainstorming, and it, it allows for the opportunity for new thinking. Michelle? Yeah, I think my my answer is along similar lines. Um, I immediately wrote down verbalize it, right? Talk about it and, and and talk about, you know, new paths and new opportunities, but also talk about the fact that you're just plain stressed <laughs> and why, right? Because I think that's part of it is, you know, sometimes people keep all of those things internal because they don't, they think they don't want to bring down the crowd. And a lot of the times that is what kind of people need to hear. They need to hear that others are experiencing the same things. And then, then they can actually talk about, talk about it and be comfortable talking about it. So I think that's really, that's really important. Good, good, good luck with giving that message to British people in the audience. <laughs> but no, I think we've had a, there's a comment in the chat simply saying normalizing the conversation. Exactly. Make it something that it's normal to talk about and mm -hmm. share it. You know, a burden shared is a burden lessened. Um, so I want to say, firstly, thank you for the presentation today. These have been fantastically. You know, there's so many ideas coming out, coming out of this to work with. But also simply thank you for doing the work. I know that you know one thing that we've certainly felt during the pandemic is the worry about there's so much information out there, how to deal with it, and so the value actually of having people who take the information out there, the ideas there, and that, but then bring it together in a way that's digestible and usable is fantastically valuable. And it's an area where there's always such a risk that no one will take down that challenge. So the OCLC has done so is a real bonus. Um, just do, do you have any sort of final words before we close? I should offer that. <laughs> I want to extend my thanks and, and acknowledge the challenges that, that everyone is feeling and the time that you're all continuing to take to show up for these conversations um, almost two years in and still looking for more information about what the future holds and how we can all get there. So thank you for continuing to do the work in all of your institutions. Yeah, I would say the same thanks, but also just continue to talk to each other, to your communities, to us, <laughs> you know, and and um, we'll see our way through this one. That's great, thank you. And, and, and I think your contact details are available on the OCLC website as well. So there's that there. Excellent, so I think good practices to end on time. So once again, thank you so much to, to Kendra, to Michelle for your time. Thank you to everyone who's been here on, the, on, on this webinar. As I said, we will put the recording up online with links to all of the resources that have been shared and I wish everyone a good evening, good morning, and good luck. <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Stephen. Goodbye. Take care. Bye-bye.